Thank you, Simon. Thanks. Oh, well, uh, Simon, thanks uh, very much for uh, such a kind introduction and uh, from uh, somebody who I have huge respect for and a, a, a distinguished former recipient of the Purifoy Award himself. Uh, the honor means a lot to me and I, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, something that really does, does mean something to me. Um, and I would also th like to also thank the organizers of the conference. It's beautifully uh, organized. And uh, the weather too, thank you. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun the next few days. Uh, so what I, I'm hoping to do is, is keep this under 40 minutes, we'll see. That'll, that's the objective. And uh, then we'll all have time for a nice walk out in the, in the fresh air afterwards. Uh, so, so the topic of uh, construction academic life cycle management, uh, it was driven by this opportunity to uh, look back and reflect on the experiences that I've had over the last 25 or 30 years. And what I'm hoping to do is just uh, open up uh, or provoke some discussion. So I'm, I'm hoping to uh, address some interesting issues. And then the outline of what I plan to talk about is on the slide. So I think that um, in our careers, we all share pretty common motivations like wanting to have an impact, um, uh, wanting to support ourselves financially and enjoy life and enjoy our work. But I also think it's, it's interesting to um, address some of the issues uh, on which our positions may be less clear and how our, and our positions kind of change uh, depending on where we're at in our careers. So some of these issues are going to percolate through the talk on, on, the, on the next few minutes. Uh, so I think that uh, how we address those dilemmas or issues, uh, and I think uh, how we achieve our goals, such as having an impact, have a lot to do with at what stage we are in our career. Um, and I don't think these stages are definitive that I've uh, suggested up here, but I think they give me an idea of, of what stages I've gone through uh, and what we all go through. For example, apprenticeship, you know that, that early stage where you're transitioning from being externally motivated by tests and exams and, and uh, people giving you tasks to being more internally motivated, setting your own goals um, and uh, you know, being achievement oriented. That's sort of an early phase and then you go through these other phases. And, and oddly enough, I think uh, probably to some extent, I'm in all of these phases still. You know, <laughs> part of me is still in all of these phases. Um, except for retirement, so don't don't get carried away. No. <laughs> the um, so I think in the early phases, a lot of what we do is focused on acquiring a basic skill set, and a lot of those skills come from uh, courses and mentors. But what I also just felt like sharing because I really enjoy it is reading uh, fiction, and I think a lot of great. Uh, uh, archetypes and characters and, and situations about our work and our life can be found in fiction and it can be really enjoyable to read books like um, uh, like C.P. Snow, the, the Strangers and the Brothers series. Uh, uh, the Masters is my favorite book out of that series. Great book kind of giving you what life was like at Cambridge for an academic in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then uh, This Town, which is kind of a riff on uh, on uh, Washington right now, it's it's that's actually the only nonfiction. Moo is a is a spoof on uh, on universities, uh, but a lot of good ones. A Canadian author, um, uh, Robertson Davies, and they just have good stories in them that I think help us uh, realize that we're not alone in our career. So, the uh, uh, and I think uh, you know you have these other skills which you try to pick up. Most uh, research universities have. Um, seminar series, graduate seminar series that try to teach these skills uh, to their PhD students and early professors. And the interesting thing is, uh, again, I think that we always are trying to get better at these. We never get good enough. And sometimes we even forget some of them. But, but these are all ones that I, I keep trying to work on and I try to uh, help my uh, graduate students uh, learn as well. So, uh, so how those skills we learn get applied to research and how we evolve our career through the various stages uh, that I, I showed up there is something I'd like to talk about next. 
And I have a model for how this happens that works for my own mind. And I actually borrowed it from a contractor's guide to contracting. So this is where the model comes from, because he talked about moving to different sectors of the industry or moving geographically, and you can only do one or the other successfully at a time. And I feel like, uh, as academics, um, we're really talking about growing tool and domain knowledge, and it, we, but it's really hard to do both at the same time. So, you know, we know we should start with the need, um, but I think that at the beginning of our careers, we often start with the hammer or the tools and, and the nails, and we start looking for some interesting problems. And so, if you, uh, when I look at my early part of my career, I really focused on those problems that I had the tool kit to address. Uh, coming out of systems, design engineering, con control systems, machine vision, artificial intelligence. So that's the kind of stuff I got into. And uh, the very first research I ever did as an undergraduate for my senior design project was just applying uh, these skills to using machine uh, vision and pattern recognition for automated uh, crack detection. So it was just, a, you know, I had this skill set and I was trying to find interesting problems. The uh, so I think, uh, so you, you end up then moving one set of uh, tools at a time or one set of applications at a time. Uh, and I think when we try to do both, we get in trouble. So I use this model more as a, as a career uh, risk management tool than anything else. It's, it tells me that if I'm getting into a new domain area and I'm having to learn some new tools, uh, I might be getting in over my head. And that might be, uh, maybe I should be careful about that or, or work with some really smart colleagues and hope they uh, tolerate me until I pick up uh, the, what I need to know. Um, so uh, when I got into grad school, did my PhD, uh, I, same set of skills got applied, 2D and 3D image analysis. So this was a, a data fusion thing with uh, uh, 2D machine vision and laser scanning trying to automatically come up with a crack network and do automatic plans for this uh, robotic crack sealer that we built. And this was actually a pretty big team that, that finally built this thing and demonstrated it. Uh, but it really fit into the zeitgeist at Carnegie Mellon at the time because the Robotics Institute was ascendant and robotics was where it was at. And so I ended up doing robotics for my PhD. That was uh, the thing to do at the time. Oh, and I had a really fun email just today from my advisor who says he might have found the lost code. So, <laughs> so apparently I don't have my software from those days. And, he, and he's cleaning out his office because he's moving. And he said he might have found it. So that's very exciting news for me. Uh, OK, so how do you decide to what, uh, what to work on next? Uh, in the early 90s, a lot of people were interested in uh, total quality management or electronic data management. Uh, other people were more into 3D CAD. Uh, and it turns out I fell more into the 3D CAD and optimization area because, again, skill set, right? So, you know, a problem was presented that I felt I could work on. And that turned out to be critical uh, and heavy lift planning. Uh, and what we really did was just go out and interview a lot of experts and formalize the procedures that, that they knew and that were proprietary knowledge, but we tried to come up with a formalization of that and implement that in a 3D environment, interactive environment. But it's also interesting, it's the first uh, really, really big uh, mistake I made uh, in my research career. I got really into the problem of relating the 3D CAD model with the relational database, which I thought was a really profound problem. And we worked really hard on relating those things and doing the software, and then uh, realized afterwards that we had just solved a, a mere technical problem that really didn't contribute to the body of knowledge. And as a result, the article that we tried to publish out of that got declined. Uh, and I just remember clearly, OK, so remember what's just a, you know, a, a technical problem and what is really a contribution to the body of knowledge. And don't kill yourself trying to work on some problem that isn't going to be a contribution. But, you know, you learn from these mistakes. So uh, in that time period, uh, UT had a lot of money from the Texas Highway Department. So a lot of us were moving into uh, transportation type problems. And uh, uh, I had some tools that I could apply to transportation problems, graph theory, signal processing. Uh, and so uh, I worked on some traffic uh, issues at the time. Uh, so at the time, we had a study corridor in San Antonio, and we were using RFID tags that were in the car. Uh, we were using uh, gates, 
and we would get travel time information, but we were fusing that with um, loop detectors, which would give us uh, uh, travel velocity and density, and, and were actually uh, um, a different kind of data. And from that, we were trying to do automated incident detection, like detection of congestion and traffic accidents. Uh, really interesting problem, a lot of data, very challenging, and uh, those contributions that we made were almost immediately made pointless uh, by the cell phone technology where you could locate cell phones, and that turned out to be much richer data set for doing this sort of in automated incident detection. So again, uh, <laughs> learn something from that. Uh, but what I, uh, the, the skill set of dealing with all the RFID tags and so on turned out to be useful later, uh, which I know some of you are probably aware. Uh, so in the 90s, uh, we also got heavily into construction robotics at Texas. Uh, I worked with some colleagues in civil and mechanical engineering. Uh, and as many of you know, this was a really active area at the time. Uh, for example, the International Symposium on Automation, Robotics, and Construction in Houston in 1992 had about 500 attendees and probably half were from industry or, or, or three-fifths. Three so it was a very exciting area and I got caught up in all that excitement and did a lot of construction robotics research. Again, partly because of the background but partly because industry did seem to be interested. And the first thing that uh, came out of my PhD, but we did three generations of this through the 90s, this was the last one we had deployed to 10 different states. Uh, in our final road trip, and we produced this really amazing high quality video, which I'll just show you briefly. It sounds like it's out of the 50s or something, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay, that goes on for a long time, so I don't want to don't want to uh, torture you with that. But but that was uh, that was a big thing for us. We spent a lot of time on that. Not a lot of journal articles, but a lot of time. <laughs> um, so we also spent a lot of all-nighters uh, designing and deploying this automated clinker clearing robot uh, for Houston Lighting and Power and EPRI, the Electrical Power Research Institute. Uh, and really sad thing is we got it out to the plant, but the video records are really sparse. Only a few slides like this one showing it up, hooked up to the big coal-fired furnace. Um, but we do have a couple, uh, you know, we did 3D simulations, augmented reality control from a fancy control station. Um, so we had these models, we had a laser scanner, we'd try to build a model in this murky environment of the rock. And that helped us uh, control so we didn't bash away at the furnace instead of the rocks. And then we also did these uh, experiments in the lab where we just wanted to make sure our machine could break uh, clinkers. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, but I also remember breaking a, a cylinder rod too because we didn't program it correctly. Uh, so the idea behind this though was to save lives and to improve safety. Definitely it was an overdesign and overkill, uh, but, but it was a good experience. The, um, so the, our, we had this large scale manipulator at the time too, which occupied a lot of our time. We had it out at the lab. Um, and the first video of its use in the field is probably as old as a lot of you guys. Um, uh, and the, what, the main contribution was to take this manipulator on the end of that 22 rough train crane, 20, uh, 22 ton, and change it from those eight manual levers, which you know you can only do two degrees of freedom at once with two hands, and change that to a space ball uh, controller. And so we had this you know, idea that we could have this giant manipulator manipulating pipe instead of using riggers and so on, and that would be a safety improvement, a productivity improvement. Uh, but the control system was so awkward that it really didn't work that well. And so the, the objective then was to try to create this more advanced control system. And um, so we moved it, this in the lab and we could take it and put it in the lab and do some experiments with it. And the idea was just to try to build up using inverse kinematics and this was an indeterminate problem. So you had to use some heuristics and a kind of a weird dynamic control system, but basically to be able to control it uh, using that space ball instead. And that's what that video was actually trying to show you. Um, so, uh, so I do think, though, 
that the work that we did in the 80s and 90s uh, at Texas and a lot of other places in construction robotics, I do think it did have some influence over the evolution of heavy equipment companies like Caterpillar and John Deere and Komatsu. So the stakeless earth moving and the excavator control, I think it might have had some influence there, partly because we had some cross-fertilization between the researchers themselves at Caterpillar and uh, Carnegie Mellon in Texas and other places. And I think it's you know influencing things still today like automated layout, which is an incredible risk reduction tool, it's a cost-saving tool, rework reduction tool on jobs. Um, that's really robotics. It's, a, it's using the same kind of skill set and, and so on. The, uh, so we moved, uh, the, what we learned there drove us into the next wave of sensing, which a lot of people got into, data fusion, uh, 3D modeling, and uh, what we were doing was throwing, whoops, I went too fast. We were throwing convex hulls uh, over obstacles to do real-time obstacle avoidance uh, because you can do that computationally with this kind of representation. And the idea was to do something like what Mercedes does today or a lot of the car companies where you would, you wouldn't, you would get a beep if you were coming close to something. Uh, and so that was the uh, rationale behind that. Uh, from that, we moved to materials locating algorithms. And a lot of you know how this worked because a lot of you have been involved in this area over the last uh, several years. Uh, so I won't really uh, linger on it, but you can, I think prof if Professor Rosavi's in the room there, she might recognize herself. I think that's her at Rockdale. There you are. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we were also up at uh, uh, Portland's up in Tro uh, Toronto. It was a, a big uh, joint uh, project uh, uh, between Professor Caldas Goodrum and, and, and a lot of graduate students and myself. Uh, and in the end, this is a commercial technology which I think we probably had some contribution to, but so did the whole community uh, working in this area. So at the time, we also had some work in 3D imaging. Uh, so with the use of laser scanning and uh, uh, 3D and 4D models, uh, you know, what we're doing in this area, and I know a lot of people work in this area, so is working on algorithms to automatically pull objects out of a point cloud, do automated uh, earned value tracking, automated quality control, uh, all sorts of, uh, and, and in different areas like structures and mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. It's a very active area of research. It's still active. Um, and I think uh, that we're having an influence here um, that our community who's working in this area, the recent article out of ENR said that there's 20 or 25 percent of companies are using some form of technology in this area. Uh, and so it's encouraging that as a community we're, we're pro we are having in some way some influence. Uh, and where we are now on that is, um, uh, is, is building that previous work where we're doing uh, automated uh, fabrication error detection as we fabricate and automated realignment planning. Uh, and there's a paper on it here at the conference that's being presented by uh, Mohammed Nahangi. So if you want to get more into that, uh, you can get what the explanation of all that fancy math up there. He'll explain all that. Um, and the focus is on structural and piping assemblies. Uh, this is just an illustration of the concept for structural assemblies. And the idea is that you could uh, automatically uh, uh, realign things using uh, existing construction actuators. And you could figure all this out and do it in real time uh, with the type of tools that we're developing in this area. Uh, and it comes out of this body of research that the whole community is involved in. So there's a six-year CII productivity program as well. Uh, CI's database uh, includes hundreds of projects, and this is an amazing, rich trove of data where we're able to tie in uh, pro uh, practice level, implementation level, IT implementation level, project performance, and productivity. And uh, this, uh, in, this is a large program of research that got concluded a few years ago. Uh, involving a, a really big team, but it led to some reasonably well-grounded observations on the relationships between these things. So what practices do drive productivity, what is, and, and some proof that IT does relate to improved productivity when it's highly integrated. So I think that was interesting. Um, and then uh, at, at Waterloo, uh, uh, we work on something in uh, uh, construction process management. Uh, with a partner that we have there who, who uh, has some uh, expertise in that area. 
And at this conference, I think uh, uh, Mr. Golzapur up there is going to uh, explain what we're doing here in this area of industry foundation processes uh, that, we're tr that we're doing in the automated workflow management area. And the idea is to encourage best practice conformance and to help facilitate interoperability and think that the workflow area has as much potential to help in that as uh, some of the BIM stuff does. Uh, so the industry foundation classes, for example. So this is a pretty exploratory area right now. So hopefully, I'm trying to move pretty quickly, but hopefully that was a reasonably quick uh, tour of what my collaborators and I were up to the last 30 years. Uh, and it's, it just shows how research can evolve over the course of a career um, based on how we learn new tools, uh, how we become knowledgeable about new application areas and problems that industry is interested in, uh, and how we are influenced by current trends, by our own colleagues. Uh, and the, the, of course, the goal of all that work is to try to have some impact. And uh, that's what I actually want to talk a little bit about next is um, what is impact and how do we have an impact? And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, impact was your reputation, and that was what your colleagues thought of you based on their judgment. Uh, for better, for worse, um, now we have bibliometrics. And the allure of bibliometrics is they seem to allow you to measure things like quantity and quality. Um, I don't think that their, their role is going to go away. We're stuck with bibliometrics because they're, they're just so powerful. Uh, but fortunately, we still have judgment. Um, some of the organizations like uh, National Science Foundation and NSERC in Canada uh, still require us to make judgment calls on intellectual content and broad impact, so it's a different kind of impact. But together, these are, these are the, the things that we want to do in academia to have an impact. Um, but I do uh, believe that bibliometrics can be useful and lead to some interesting observations. Uh, and just an, as, a, as an example, I've got some data here from uh, one study that we did on uh, articles that were focused on how different factors like weather and congestion impact productivity. And uh, we found that the ones that had a really clear statistical uh, foundation, a lot of data and, and good rigorous analysis, uh, had a lot more impact over time. So that's those, those golden uh, squares. Uh, they had more impact in terms of citations over time than articles that were maybe a little bit more uh, case study oriented or more um, conceptually oriented. And, and those who obviously had a contribution because they got reviewed and accepted and published. But it's just interesting to show that uh, bibliometrics can, can give you some idea of the different outcome of those different types of uh, validation approaches. Um, so, but I, I, from my personal perspective, the, and I think a lot of our, a lot of you, a lot of my colleagues, we really think of impact in two dimensions. We think of impact on science, and that can be through um, uh, our work, our work, uh, our students, and how they uh, go on, and the the legacy we leave there. But also our impact on practice. And um, I think that somebody who's done, there's been a really interesting study in this area by Drs. Uh, uh, Son and Thomas at uh, CII, and I just want to share that really quickly. Because um, here what they've done is they've plotted um, focus area product downloads for the CII research over the last uh, 30 years, or 30-something years, against um, citation counts. And what they note is that um, the best practices, which are these ones in blue up here, uh, the ones that are highlighted in blue, are most often downloaded by industry and by academia. And that's just interesting to me that, uh, uh, that the things that really have had an impact that, that, that CII considers uh, high impact are the ones that both academia and industry appreciate to some extent. And there's just some good uh, numerical foundation for that. Okay, so uh, so we're it's a little controversial maybe how we measure impact. I just threw up a couple of ideas to get us thinking. Uh, we, the way we have an impact is always in collaboration with others, and I think I wanted to point out that many of these collaborators that I've worked with over the years were role models for me, 
And uh, from looking at them and seeing how they became successful or how they were successful, I made some observations about styles and strategies, which I thought I'd really quickly share, and uh, maybe even a few about mistakes. Um, so it's just interesting because I know sometimes we sit down over a, over a, over a refreshment uh, uh, after a conference or in a conference like this, we think about those people who really had an impact and how they did it, and we think, what was their strategy or did they have a strategy? And I think different models come out uh, and the people I admire followed one or more of these models. They were either their relentless focus and dedication model, and that would be people like maybe a Jimmy Hinsey who, was, who just had this amazing contribution in safety, uh, or the people who uh, are very good at having a, a periodic strategic refocus. And the people I can think of in that area would be uh, Chris Hendrickson or, or Ray Levitt maybe. Uh, I'm using examples of people who are further along in their career, so nobody, including myself, here in this room. Uh, but these, these are the models I think of. And then I also think that it is possible to have a pretty large and eclectic and varied portfolio of research and be successful. And to me, uh, a good example, that would be Richard Tucker, who's, who's been really successful over the years. And I know, you know, you, maybe you're not going to follow one of these models, but I think it's you follow the one that fits you or the combination of them that fit you, and you don't have to follow one or the other. And, and I think that's just the main point, that, it's, that, that there's no one model to career success. Um, as far as factors that lead to success and what I observed uh, knowing these people over the years, uh, I just created a short list, and any one of us could have sat down and done this, right? Um, I'm really interested, I would really be curious someday to kind of do a survey of the room and just find out how these factors are weighted among the people in this room and maybe how uh, also separated by age range or experience range. Uh, my personal favorite too that I think really if I pull out all my experience over the years looking at people and how they do, I think hard work for some reason just sort of rises to the top and then character and ethics. The, the, those two things seem to just drive the people who are successful more than any of these other, you know, important but maybe not as important uh, factors. Uh, but I, I just thought I needed to throw this in because, you know, when you're at, you're doing academic uh, life cycle management, you make a lot of mistakes, and uh, uh, I have made all these mistakes, which is annoying. Uh, does anybody know what a goniometer is? Just stick up your hand. I'm not going to ask you to define what a goniometer is. That actually makes me feel a lot better because I spent three years working on the replacement of a goniometer, which is literally like reinventing a wheel. So, so just so you know, you know, sometimes if you don't know the word, just talk to people who might know some word that's important to you. And goniometer was very important. I could have saved three years of work. Uh, so a lot of these mistakes over the years. Um, uh, and I won't get into, you know, even the hard truths, right? You've got six contracts, they all run out in six months. Uh, it's time maybe that you started generating some new business. So, but it, it's easy in academia to kind of avoid these, these kind of looming disasters coming down the end of the, you know, the tunnel there. So, uh, it turns out that I made all those mistakes. I was going to spend a long time giving you examples, but, but, uh, uh, I think we'll keep moving here in the interests of time. Um, uh, so I made all of these. Uh, fortunately, we have our peer review process to point these out to us. Uh, and what's most annoying to me, though, is I've made the last one uh, too many times. So <laughs> uh, just kind of frustrating. But you, know, you get a little, maybe a little better over time. Okay. The uh, so. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was a hint. I thought we were done. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Well, time to move on a little bit. We need to talk about renewal and sustainability. Uh, and uh, these are other things that I observed that people somehow manage to do. I think it's always a challenge, though. You want to get good at something. You want to get efficient at it so you can produce more articles. But if you keep going on that, it's going to become stale. And so you've got to find that balance between efficiency and getting out of your comfort zone. And I think that's a big part of uh, renewal and sustainability. 
which is part of uh, long-term success in academia. I always try to keep a skunk works going, which is uh, using uh, obscure little bits of funds to try doing weird things that sometimes grow into big things. Uh, Bershu Akinsey and, and Carlos Caldas and I did uh, an interesting study once years ago that was just a little skunk works study that turned out real good um, in RFID tags. I like to meet people in other areas. I like to go to interesting workshops because they get your brain thinking, so uh, we've got to keep doing those. I really like to be driven by industry problems. I think that's what drives creativity more than anything, is just being understanding a problem from industry's point of view, and then we can be creative. Uh, and also, my students come up with most of the ideas anyways. They're, they're always on the leading edge. They're always thinking, and they're always uh, uh, aware of what's going on. Um, I think import, uh, mentorship's important. I'm going to speed up a bit, though. Uh, the important thing here is that we get it and we have to give it back, uh, but it keeps going. So it turns out I still have mentors. My father is still working. He's a mentor. Chris Hendrickson, Richard Tucker, these are mentors for me. So we all, have, hopefully we, we don't get too old to have mentors, but hopefully we're also trying to give some of that back, too. So uh, coming full circle to the career dilemmas thing, um, I don't think I really came to any conclusion on any of these. My big conclusion is these aren't really dilemmas. These are all just issues of balance. So all these things that we're worried about all the time, uh, that we, we worry about how we should spend our time, what approach we should take, I really think that you just find the balance that fits you, and, and, and we're all fine, and we're all different. So I was just going to spend the last little bit um, talking about future directions because Thomas said I should, uh, wherever Thomas is. So, uh, And uh, I just thought it would be interesting. I don't really have any special vision of the future. I wish I did because I, I, it would be great to be on the leading edge more often. Um, but I do think that the leading edge of these curves most often come from outside our area. So one of the important things is to always be looking outside of our own area. Um, and I think we should always realize that collaboration and creativity are, or, or sorry, creativity is collaborative, and that's so that we always have to be really working and getting ideas from our students and colleagues as well. The um, areas that I think are going to uh, grow, I think, are complex systems, and I think there's at least a couple papers here on complexity and complex systems. Uh, one area that we worked on uh, with, Carn uh, sorry, with CII was interface management on mega projects. You've got all these organizations all over the world working 24-7, exchanging all sorts of engineering products. It's not linear, it's iterative, uh, and it's complex, and it's really a challenge to manage, uh, but there's other complex uh, systems. I think that uh, a really interesting area isn't so much big data, but figuring out how we can present big data so that we can use our own human intuition and pattern recognition to pull useful knowledge out of big data. And the example I use is the simplest one I could think of, which is Google Maps. Uh, I can see a snowstorm squall coming across southern Ontario from the lake, blocking the highway on my way to a job real time with this because I can see the traffic slow down. And I think it's incredibly powerful and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some really creative work in this area. I know over the years, Alan Russell did a lot of work in this area, but I think there's a lot more to do in, in visualization of, of big data. Um, I think that uh, uh, there's a renaissance in construction robotics, partly because of computing and sensing power uh, and things like uh, virtu uh, uh, 3D imaging. The, uh, the one that I really like uh, is... Uh, one that I'm just going to play this really quick. I, uh, we want to. We don't want to run out of time. But I really like this video because it's creative.
Okay, for some reason that just really intrigues me because it brings together biomimetics and complex systems and robotics and it's people outside of our own community and I just think maybe uh, we could get some good ideas from that. I don't know what, but maybe some good ideas. Um, and, uh, you know, some of us are going to the next robotics uh, uh, conference right after this one in Olu, Finland. It's a really strong area. Uh, there's 32 years of, of conferences in this area and I... Uh, encourage you to go to the next one next year in, I think it's in Auburn. So, uh, so it should be one uh, on our own continent, which will be uh, easy. Uh, the other thing that I think are, uh, there's some really interesting new areas, peer-to-peer, -peer, the internet's just created with Uber and all these other innovations. These are percolating into construction. So big companies like Caterpillar and National Rental are doing some amazing things with peer-to-peer -peer and asset sharing. Uh, that I think I, I don't see as much research on, but I think it's really rich uh, for doing research in that area. Uh, augmented reality is one that CII almost, I think, did some work on, and this is a really neat area too. Google, Daiquiri, some of these companies. Uh, you know, we've got colleagues who are really good in this area too and probably did the foundational work, and now it's becoming uh, commercial. So, so there's some really neat stuff coming out, uh, and augmented reality, I think, is going to be a huge area for us. I also think that because of all these advances, there's also going to be advances in health, safety, and environment. And uh, so one of the things that we're doing now with the University of Michigan and with the uh, uh, systems design department of Waterloo is a series of studies where we're, having, we're building um, 20 walls of 50 concrete masonry units each. We're videotaping from five different directions so we can get videogrammetry data. And we have these uh, people outfitted with uh, inertial motion units so that we can recreate the motion. Uh, like that stick figure down there, that's a recreation from the IMUs. And from this we can get a lot of interesting uh, data on how we can reduce musculoskeletal disorders in the future, but also how we can help these workers be more uh, efficient and effective. Um, okay, so that was a, an old guy doing that. Uh, this is a video of a masonry instructor. The interesting thing about this is this guy is uh, twice as fast as the previous guy. The quality of the wall when he's finished is is at least twice as good or maybe three times better. Um, and it's just interesting to be able to make these comparisons. Uh, the old guy in the previous video was me. Probably some of you picked that up. Um, uh, and it, it took me an hour to put those up. It took this guy 26 minutes and he was just relaxing. Uh, and he also uses one hand. So it just a uh, real interesting area of research that I think has some, some potential. I also think there'll be other areas like 3D printing. A lot of you are familiar with that. Um, what's really cool is I think it's getting to the point where we'll actually print uh, uh, building uh, scale components, uh, which is, is cool, or like Koshnevis, I guess, at uh, USC actually extrude whole buildings. I like this one. I just think it's really cool by these uh, Dutch folks. Um, but what's interesting is I clearly remember uh, thinking I should use the crack sealer uh, for 3D printing 15 years ago converting it because crack sealing was getting old and thinking, no, that'll never fly. That's, that's a dumb idea. So, uh, so that, was, that, was, that was wrong. But um, the neat thing about these guys is they also have assembly drawings, which is like some of the stuff coming out of Stanford right now. I think this is a big area too uh, that's very interesting. Um, I was in New York City. I love New York City. I was at the Museum of Modern Art in their design section. And I was really intrigued, this was just about two or three weeks ago, with this kinematic stress. Uh, you scan a body, uh, so it could be a, a dress or it could be a, a vest, uh, and from that 3D scan, you create an automated tessellation, and from that you print these, uh, this kinematic stress that uh, these 3D, these triangular facets have hinges between each facet, so it basically covers the, the flow of your body. I'm not really sure what this has got to do with construction, except it's kinematics, it's 3D printing, and I feel like there's got to be a really good research idea here. Um, 
I don't know what it is, but I think there's got to be something here. So somebody in the audience is going to take this and, and do something really cool with it, I hope. Okay. And finally, my last, uh, last example uh, is new materials, I think, always in construction. We don't really develop new materials, but we should always be thinking about how we can use new materials. And this one, I think, is particularly cool. These bricks are being grown from a combination of corn husks and mycelium, which I guess is some kind of mold. Uh, and uh, the structure is designed, there's different colors of these bricks. It's designed to be carbon neutral. Uh, and it's just a fascinating idea to me. I don't know if it has any practical long-term consequence, uh, but if you can grow structures, that also seems like a pretty cool idea. And, uh, you know, maybe put constructors out of business, right? Uh, so, all that uh, in summary. Uh, it made me think after I did all this, what were we thinking 25 years ago? It turns out that a lot of the people in the room here uh, we're thinking ab uh, about stuff that has become useful now, so that's pretty cool. Uh, there are a lot of things that we weren't thinking about 20 years ago that we never even imagined would be so influential today in our research. Um, so when I thought about having a few minutes at the end of the talk on you know, the future of construction engineering, I realized I don't really know. Um, but uh, you know what really intrigues me is what are we not thinking about, right? What, what is it that's, that's going to come along, that's going to change the game, and we don't have a clue right now? And I just, I wish I did know, because I, th I think that would be interesting. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, I would like to, that was a long rambling presentation, but uh, it, about uh, academic career lifecycle management, but I was just trying to hopefully share some of what I learned over the years uh, and how that, how that flows over the years, and maybe uh, we can raise some interesting questions and some issues that we can talk about tonight over a beer. Um, so I would like to support, uh, or sorry, acknowledge the support of my family, which has always been fantastic, my colleagues and students, uh, and the financial support of, of CII, NSERC, National Science Foundation. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been a really collaborative enterprise, and I'm looking forward to the next 25 years. So thank you. <laughs>